Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechGeek webinar series, our endeavor to impart techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is Consultants' View on Network Security. And this is the fourth session in the IT security series that we have going on on TechGeek. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Akshay Kalkura, Assistant Manager at KPMG. Akshay has over 13 years of experience in the areas related to networks, security, data centers, VoIP and information security. He is currently associated with KPMG and has reviewed and designed network architectures for several clients in various industries such as telecom, FMCG, software, manufacturing and financial services etc. His experience comprises of engagements related to global, global network transformation, IPv6, SCADA, telecom security, data center design review, ITIS audits, and testing of Cisco ISR products. He has conducted several trainings related to network, routing pro protocols, units, etc. He strongly believes in the best way to gain knowledge is by sharing knowledge. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Mr. Akshay. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mohini, for that introduction. And uh, a special thanks to TechCake for enabling this collaboration and uh, bringing all the techie tech community together. So thanks for that. And uh, dear friends, a very good afternoon to all of you. And thanks a bunch for attending this session on a Friday afternoon. I know it's kind of tough after probably a heavy meal or it might be a holiday for some of you since today being a good Friday. So hats off to all of you. So today's topic is on uh, consultants view on network security. I'll just move on to the next slide. Okay. Okay, this is just to say that I mean it's I'm doing this on a personal capacity and uh, KPMG is not associated in any way with information or data being uh, presented or discussed during this particular session. So primarily, I mean, uh, since my experience comprises of working with uh, internet service provider, managed service provider, and my association with uh, Cisco as well for about five years, and uh, then during my, I mean, my stint in KPMG, I have worked with various clients, seen various network infrastructure, so based on all this, I mean, I put across few things which might be uh, suitable for this particular audience. So coming to the next slide, which is on agenda. So what I realized was the people who are attending this webinar are ranging from freshers to network administrators to security administrators to program managers. Hence, I have kind of structured this to suit everyone's needs hopefully and uh, my PPT is just about 10 to 12 slides so I think you must be happy so that it doesn't put you off to sleep uh, but I hope at the end of the session there will be definitely some kind of takeaway for each one of you so the agenda is going to be like this so my first slide is going to be on sample network architecture uh, where I'll be touching upon the uh, architecture covering LAN, WAN security and voice over IP and uh, second will be on network design consideration then I'll be touching upon network operations what are the key elements in ensuring you know, the maintenance or the operations of a network then oh, this is something which is you know, very interesting for me so it's the power of people process and technology so I will be talking about that as well and then this is uh, slide on sample network security products and the last one is going to be on some useful links where uh, you can get good information and keep yourself updated all the time so let's move on to the next slide which is the first slide so this is on the sample network architecture so like I mentioned uh, I would be covering the LAN, WAN, security, voice or IP both from architecture, security, and even from audit perspective. 
because I know many of you would be facing audits from uh, uh, other consultants who come and uh, take a look at your network and see what is right, what is wrong, are there any security holes in your network. So I'll be talking about uh, that as well in this particular slide. So here the scenario, I mean the way I've uh, designed this particular uh, diagram, I mean this is not an ideal network. This is only to show what are the different components uh, a particular network might have. So it is like connecting a couple of buildings and then having internet, van, etc. So please don't uh, assume that this is the most ideal architecture, etc. That is not the case. So coming to uh, the end user perspective. So the end user perspective, you can connect either from laptops or from desktops or there are also wireless uh, users using laptops or even mobile devices. So essentially the on the wired network you will have your connectivity to the switches. So the connection is via CAT6 cable or CAT5 cable but at the moment CAT6A is kind of or latest because it supports uh, 10 gigabit and you might have seen in your organizations that these switches might probably be housed in a room called uh, you know, hub room or something like that so you can have a single switch or multiple switches so that depends entirely on the number of users in that particular floor or in that particular building so if there are about 100 users you might have a couple of uh, 248 port switch or 348 port switch and uh, accordingly it will be stacked. And from wireless point of view, you will have an access point or wireless routers which are placed at key locations in your uh, office premise. So it will probably be mounted on the ceiling and uh, this is to enable mobility for users who are having a laptop when they move from their desk to the meeting room or vice versa in different locations of your office premises. So these switches are typically known as access switches because they connect directly to your endpoints. Okay, the next part is on core switches. So typically the architecture in a LAN comprises of core, distribution and access. So the core is like the heart of your uh, the LAN environment, the core switches. So all the traffic uh, aggregates and comes towards the core. And after core, it goes to the firewall and internet router or WAN and then goes out. So in this particular scenario, uh, if you can see that there is also a building B. So here the representation is that, I mean the idea is if there are two buildings and if they need to communicate with each other. So in building B, you might probably have distribution switches and also access switches which ultimately connect to the endpoint. The connectivity between these two buildings will be typically on fiber. The reason being uh, the connection might be beyond 100 meters for which your regular CAT6 will not work. So you will use a uh, fiber uh, which is like a multi-mode fiber because single mode is more expensive and it covers much larger distances. And all the traffic comes and connects to the core switches. So this is from a LAN perspective. So next I'm just jumping to the internet part. So if you can see, I mean, there are two routers and then two connections to the internet. The reason being why it is, uh, why I've shown two connections is, one is redundancy, which is very important. So if one router fails, the other router will take over. And even from internet links, it is advisable to have from a different service provider. So in case one service provider's network fails, the other service provider's network will still be available and uh, there will not be any issues with respect to availability. So hence it is recommended to have mul uh, internet links from multiple service providers. And next I am uh, talking about WAN. So WAN links are say for example you have site A. If you see on the left hand side of the slide you can see site A. So if site A wants to talk to site B which is remotely located in a geographically uh, different location so the way you can communicate with um, both these sites is either via having a dedicated point-to-point -point link which is known as leased lines or you can probably have MPLS links uh, between these two sites. So the advantage of MPLS which is becoming very popular or it's already popular uh, is you are using the infrastructure of the service provider. 
So uh, this way, I mean, uh, you, the lead time to get the links is very fast and uh, even the bandwidth, etc. you want to increase, I mean, it is very fast uh, compared to a traditional lease line connectivity. And in the event, again, uh, why you need two uh, links is if one link fails, the other one takes over. So this again depends on the business requirements. So if your business is very critical that your connectivity to both these sites uh, is critical, then you can probably go for two MPLS lines or two dedicated lines. If not, you can use alternate uh, methods of backup such as uh, ISDN, but ISDN I think is popular in India, uh, or, uh, or a traditional lease line as a backup. Okay. Next I'm introducing the firewall in this picture. So if you can see the red arrow from the router to site B, the reason I put that is in the event your WAN links between site A and site B fail or even the, uh, the backup link also fails, the other method of communication between these two sites is via having a site to site uh, VPN configured using the internet connection. So this is also a very secure way of connecting both the sites. But again, I mean, through the VPN, uh, there might be some latency. So the performance may not be um, as similar as, use, uh, as uh, using a, a dedicated line or an MPLS link. So typically, I mean, this is used for uh, uh, as a backup. But in some cases where a third party needs to connect your network, you will probably have uh, or dedicated uh, VPN tunnels to each of your uh, companies or your clients or your contractors, etc. So any third party company. And on the left hand side, if you can see the arrow which shows teleworker connecting via VPN, yeah, this is another method of uh, connecting from home or hotel or airport where a user can log in anywhere into the corporate network using the remote VPN uh, capabilities of your network. And again, I mean, the firewall, the reason why I've shown a couple of firewalls is uh, if one firewall fails, the other one can, can take over. So you can configure like active-active or active standby. So it depends. And, uh, and also, if you see the optional firewall in the WAN link, that again depends. So if you're connecting, if site A and site B are of the same company, then you can probably trust site B. But in the event, site B is a third-party uh, company, then probably a firewall will definitely help because you wouldn't want uh, any other traffic apart from what is expected to connect to your corporate network. Okay, and um, and again, once again, I want to reiterate that you no, know, just having two firewalls in your network may not serve the purpose. For example, in a banking network, you might have three layers of firewall, and uh, and and each firewall may be from a different vendor to ensure that if one firewall does not detect uh, any kind of attack, the other one can uh, probably detect and then you know, allow only the uh, specific traffic to flow into the network. So, and you might also have firewalls specifically for applications uh, as well. And coming to this uh, DMZ, what you see, so DMZ plays a key role. I mean, most of the networks in many organizations will have a DMZ. So DMZ stands for Demilitarized Zone. The reason why you need to have a DMZ is uh, where you can host your servers, which is uh, which has to be accessible by the uh, internet. So servers such as mail server, DNS, FTP, or any other kind of server which needs to be accessed by internet is uh, located in the DMZ. One of the prime reason for this is if in case one of the servers is compromised by a hacker, he will not be able to compromise the other servers in the internal network. Because the other option could have been that this particular server could have been inside the network and NAT could have been configured on the firewall or on the router. But the problem is if the server is compromised and it is placed in the inside network, then the other networks are also in a danger of being compromised by the hacker. So that's the reason why you have a DMZs uh, in the network. And you can also configure multiple DMZs in the network. Okay, I've just uh, 
if you see below the firewall, I just put two IPS there. So, but again, the IPS can be positioned anywhere in the network. It can be positioned in the DMZ or between the firewall router or between the core switch and firewall. So, it depends on where you want uh, the packets to be uh, monitored and ensure there is no attacks happening. So, IPS typically, I mean, it stands for intrusion prevention system. So, it can be configured for inline. So, uh, the advantage of configuring it for inline is if it detects any attack, it can block that particular IP address or etc. from performing any other uh, attacks in future. Or even the firewall also can, firewall rule also can be updated using this particular IPS. Okay, the next one if you see uh, near the core switches, there's a server farm. So the server farms are typically connected to the core switch and uh, the servers can comprise of syslog server, uh, storage area network, backup, proxy servers, etc. So any kind of servers which is typically used by the internal network are uh, located here. So again, I mean you can protect your server farm by having a separate firewall or uh, the switches, the core switches also have the capability of having a uh, firewall module uh, included in them. So you can probably purchase a firewall module inserted in the core switch and ensure that all traffic through the to the server farm passes through the firewall. And um, in terms of application, database, etc., so you have something called three-tier ar architecture where um, many of the companies, I mean, typically uh, ask for it. The reason being you'll have a firewall between uh, internal external network and the web interface. Between web interface and application, you'll have another firewall. And between application and database, you'll have another firewall. So that's the reason why you call it as three-tier architecture. So again, it all depends on what the business needs and on the business requirements. So accordingly, you'll have to uh, design your network. OK. The next element is uh, uh, what I have shown here is an, I've introduced an IP phone into the network. So where the IP phone is connected to the LAN. And uh, over here I'm just I'm taking Cisco as an example. So uh, the IP phone typically gets registered to the call manager. So the call manager is the heart of uh, the voice over IP uh, network. So it has information related to the numbers of each of the IP phones in the network and the call routing details as well, where uh, any, uh, if you want to dial any particular number, it will go to the call manager and then the call manager will route your call accordingly, either over the van or within the LAN, etc. So IP also plays, IP phones also play critical, um, uh, it's a critical component in the network and there are yeah, security issues related to them as well, which I will touch upon in a few minutes. So this is typically from the architecture point of view. So where I've tried to cover the various components on LAN, WAN, security, internet, etc. So now I'm going to touch upon uh, each of the elements from security point of view. So coming to the uh, user part, the end user part, so you can also have technologies such as NAC, which is network admission control. So where you can you know, restrict access to your LAN only to specific uh, machines with on specific MAC addresses. So that is one of the methods of NAC. The other methods are you can have certificates or based on the posture of your endpoint, you can decide whether that uh, endpoint can connect to the network or not. For example, if the antivirus is not updated or if the patches are not updated on, a, uh, on the end user, you can probably quarantine it and ensure it is updated and only then allow that to connect to the network. So this way you are allowing only authorized uh, end users to connect to the network and ensure the network is not you know, affected by an unauthorized uh, end user connecting to the network. The other thing is on endpoint security. So endpoint security plays a key role. So endpoint security is related to the firewall, the antivirus, anti-malware, etc. So all sorts of things which protect your endpoint from any malicious viruses or trojans or worms etc. 
And the third element is on DLB. DLB is data leakage prevention. So this again depends on the kind of business you run. So assuming the end users work on very confidential information or financial information or uh, company proprietary information and the company needs to uh, ensure that this data is not taken out by the employee either through USB drive or either by sending a mail through Gmail or anything I mean to the external world. So the way DLP works is you will have a uh, software on the endpoint as well as you will have DLP even on the uh, network uh, side I mean before it goes to the internet so basically it will monitor so in, uh, based on keywords etc it can be configured so if you try to send out any confidential information the DLP will be able to pick it up either you can stop that from being transmitted or allow transmission and then you know, inform the administrator so that appropriate action can be taken upon that employee because what is happening is most of the cases there is a lot of information everywhere and there are high chances of uh, uh, the uh, information being leaked or taken out by the end users so that's why it's very critical and desktop security uh, when I talk about desktop security it's primarily on uh, what are the kind of uh, no, uh, settings which are there on the desktop like for example unnecessary services can be uh, disabled or uh, ensure it is uh, up to date and uh, kind of ensure it only the needed services or uh, required uh, things are configured on the end user laptop or workstations <clears throat> and also like things like logging audit logging etc can be configured as part of desktop security Okay, coming to the next part, I mean here typically you're talking about uh, server security, OS security, uh, database security. So these also play, I mean, key a role uh, as part of the security. I mean, every organization who wants to secure the data, etc., need to ensure that they adhere to some controls or some kind of a standard which ensures that the servers are secure. So even for if uh, to prevent any uh, attacks happening on the host systems you can also include a host based IDS intrusion detection system so which typically I mean uh, sends an alert when there are any unauthorized or malicious um, attacks being uh, happening on the uh, servers okay okay this particular piece I mean it talks about uh, various ways you can secure your uh, various components in the network so from security perspective it is important you secure your wireless router your switches the switches also have to be secure then uh, your voice over IP has to be secure IPS firewall security etc internet router security anything I mean any network component in the network has to be secured. When I mean secured, it's mostly from configuration perspective. For example, for wireless router. So wireless router, you can allow only specific MAC addresses to connect uh, to the uh, access point, and also you can also not broadcast the SSID session uh, IDs. Uh, this is to allow anyone uh, uh, to know what wireless network is available, and they may probably try connecting to it. So it is advisable to disable broadcasting of SSID and authentication is another uh, key aspect of um, wireless router and yeah logging of course is required to detect any malicious activities and encryption also plays a key role so WPA2 is uh, the most preferred encryption with respect to wireless and it is not at all advisable to use in WEP because it can be easily sniffed and broken and any traffic which is passing on the wireless using WEP can be sniffed easily so it is not advisable to use WEP at all and coming to switches and router so typical things what you can configure is uh, no, uh, restrict the access to these devices from specific management stations and do not allow uh, re access to this from anywhere in the network for example if I'm an employee and sitting on the LAN 
I should not even be able to telnet or SSH. I mean, SSH is preferred over telnet because it's encrypted. I should not even get a prompt when I do a SSH on the switch or on the router. It should be restricted only to specific management stations in the network. Then, uh, even from user's point of view, for example, if it's a huge network and you have multiple administrators, it is recommended to have a AAA. Uh, AAA stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. And probably you can have TACAX or something configured in your network so that each user will have a specific privilege level uh, based on his role. For example, only uh, uh, if it's a service desk and he wants to run only few commands and check the status of the router, etc., then he should be assigned a privilege level uh, which meets those requirements. And for an administrator, it can be of a higher privilege. So the reason why AAA is important is also allows accounting. At the end of the day, I mean, if you want to go back to your logs and see who performed what and what day, this will definitely uh, going to help. And uh, things like SNMP is also uh, quite critical. Uh, nowadays, SNMP v3 is more popular because it is authentication based and it is more secure than SNMP v2. And uh, yeah, and in SNMP v2, if you are still using, avoid using the default uh, community strings and try to make it more complex as per your uh, password policy, like eight characters and complex characters, etc., mix of uh, alpha, numeric, etc. So that is quite uh, critical. And uh, uh, yeah, and probably you can also disable some of the unwanted services on these devices because things uh, like vendors like Cisco and all have a bunch of services which are enabled by default. So you may probably need to uh, run a tool and figure out which services are not required and probably disable them to make it more secure. And another key aspect of all these devices is also logging. Logging is very critical and uh, you should, depending again on the business requirement, you should, I mean, have a syslog server or some kind of logging mechanism like an SIEM tool where you can um, send all the logs to a central location, uh, configure it to be monitored and send alerts for any critical events, either via email or SMS. And logging always helps in the case of uh, any event or any incident you can always go back to the logs and see what has happened, who has done from which IP address, etc. So for this, for this kind of uh, investigation purpose, you also need to ensure that timestamps are common across all these devices. So NTP, which is Network Time Protocol, plays a very important role in this. So for example, if your switch is configured for a different timestamp and your router is in a different timestamp, then correlation of all these events becomes very tough and it will and if you're performing an investigation or forensic kind of thing, it is not going to help at all. So ensure all the devices, servers, etc., are pointing to an NTP server and have a common timestamp across. And uh, with respect to uh, IPS security, I mean, just ensure that unwanted, I mean, for example, there might be four interfaces out of which you're using only two, the remaining two can be disabled, etc. And just ensure the signatures are up to date on this um, IPS. And from firewall perspective, I mean, the best thing is uh, uh, by default it should be a deny all and you should allow only a traffic what is intended to go out or come inside. And again, the configurations have to be reviewed on a periodic basis to ensure that you know, it meets the current requirements. So in many cases, what happens, you might uh, configure a rule for some particular reason, but then you might forget to remove it from the firewall and it could be lying there in the firewall. So that particular rule can be misused by a hacker or a malicious user. So it is important to review the configuration files on a periodic basis. And coming to the routers which are facing the internet, they are again prone to a lot of DOS attacks. Uh, so you need to ensure that you have configurations which prevent uh, DOS attacks from the internet and also uh, IP spoofing. IP spoofing is another important thing. So external networks will uh, try to pretend that you know, you're from internal and then try to get access. So you should have configurations which prevent IP spoofing as well. Coming to voice over IP. So voice over IP again is becoming very popular in terms of uh, security issues. The reason being 
the kinds of attacks you can face on a voice over IP are now people can sniff the voice. I mean, they can uh, try to see what is what uh, a person user A, a person A is talking to person B. You can easily sniff if it is not encrypted. And there are also methods where you can modify the communication. So user A tells something to user B. You can tap that conversation, modify it, and send it to user B. So user B might hear something entirely different from what user A actually said. So these kind of things are becoming very uh, common nowadays. And there are things like toll frauds, where uh, people can get into the network and make international calls from your network without even anyone knowing it, unless you get a, a bill at the end of the month and you realize there are a bunch of unauthorized calls. So which has a major impact on the organization in terms of legality, in terms of financial implications. So it is important, I mean, to configure your voice network to ensure that only the users can dial specific numbers and also, if possible, to configure secure uh, communications of voice over IP because by default it works on RTP, real-time transport protocol. However, you can also configure something called secure RTP. So where your transmission is uh, encrypted and you can uh, prevent malicious user from sniffing your uh, packets. So even there are cases where uh, 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 mailboxes, the voice mailboxes have been hacked and people have retrieved information from that. So from voice perspective, just ensure that uh, everything is configured properly and again reviewed and try to avoid direct connectivity between PSTN and IP network. In India, it is not legal to connect PSTN directly to IP. I am not sure about other countries though. So even from legality perspective, it will be an issue if you connect PSTN to IP. <coughs> but from, uh, yeah, so just ensure that uh, these things are taken into consideration while um, configuring a voice or IP network. So that's all I have uh, from this particular uh, slide. So I hope it was quite informative so far. So you can have your questions noted down and uh, probably towards the end of the session you can ask. I mean, I'll try my best to answer your questions, but just in case I cannot, you can always drop me a note to the email ID which is shown at the uh, bottom of the slide. And uh, I will definitely, I mean, check and get back to you because again, I'm I am not an expert expert in this field. <clears throat> okay, the next slide is on uh, network design considerations. So what do we have here? The first one is on availability. Okay, you might have seen availability, everybody wants 99.9999% everywhere and uh, availability is a key thing. The reason being if something goes down, it is going to affect your business as well. So there is a lot of financial implications and also reputation is at stake when uh, your server is not available or your network is not available, etc. So it is important to have, uh, to take into consideration availability. And when I talk about availability, it comprises various things. For example, power supply. Your device should have dual, dual power supply options, and even you should have dual UPSs or dual generators, etc. This is from power supply perspective. And even from routing of cables from your service providers to your uh, router, it should be diversified. I mean, you should not have both the cables coming together, etc. The reason being in the event of a fire or anything, uh, then if both the cables are affected, then uh, availability will be an issue. So it is always advisable to have diversified routing of cables, even from service provider uh, to the building and within the building as well. <clears throat> and uh, it is important to take care of hygiene factor as well. I mean, just ensure that your cables are not prone to uh, uh, lot of dust and it should not be open and accessible to anybody. It should be concealed and free from rodents, uh, from water leakage, 
So typically in data center, I mean, you might see a rodent uh, repellent or water leakage detection in the data center below the raised flooring. So this is to ensure that you no know, uh, the cables are not cut, etc. And physical security also plays a key role on uh, for availability. So for example, you have a server room or a data center, and if you don't have proper access control, so anybody can go inside, uh, pull out the cable, or, or do something malicious, and then come out without uh, anyone, I mean, detecting it. So things like physical security and how you uh, keep your equipments in the rack, ensure your rack doors are closed, etc., and ensure your cables are properly marked and labeled, and it should be in a neat fashion. So it's easy for troubleshooting as well, and even from availability perspective. <clears throat> so availability plays a key role. The next is on capacity. Okay, I can see a huge burger there. I'm kind of hungry at the moment because it's still lunch time for me out here in Dubai. <clears throat> yeah, so capacity is again a key component. The reason being when you're sizing your network, say you're having a new network set up and you need to know what is your current capacity in terms of number of users, what is the kind of bandwidth you require, what is the kind of uh, uh, usage which will be there on those devices, so accordingly, you need to size your um, network. So for example, if I take uh, Cisco, US, Cisco 1800, 2900, 2800, 3800 routers. So depending on your uh, capacity and future requirements, you need to ensure that you buy the right product. Otherwise, uh, there will definitely be uh, issues related to performance later on. Coming to redundancy. Okay, the reason why I put this particular picture is it has Pizza Hut and it also says we have pizza, which is like redundant information. But I think many of you will already be aware of redundancy since I've spoken about it in the last slide. So the reason for redundancy is if one thing fails, uh, the other one can take over. So if one firewall fails, other one can take over. If one router fails, other one can take over. If one switch fails, other one can take over. So it is very important from uh, uh, availability perspective also that you have multiple uh, devices in place and multiple links in place. So once again I would like to reiterate the fact that this totally depends on the business requirement. If your business is not critical and you can probably survive with a single device, I mean otherwise there will be a lot of financial implications in procuring one more device, maintaining it, etc. So a lot of uh, uh, things depends on what uh, the business requirements are. So the key thing to remember is the technical requirements should be aligned with the business requirements. <coughs> the second, I mean the other thing is on security. Security is a very key aspect uh, as uh, in your network design consideration. So the, one of the three principles of security is confidentiality, integrity and availability. So when you say confidentiality, it uh, depends. I mean, it talks about how secure you can keep your data. If you are, uh, how it should not be accessible to anybody. I mean, that is what confidentiality talks about. How can you ensure that your data is secure within your network? So, like I mentioned, you can have uh, uh, your data stored in your databases, and that can be encrypted so that anyone who is having access to the data, uh, database. Uh, may not even be able to read the contents of the database because it is already encrypted. Or for example, if you're transmitting something from point A to point B and if it is through IPsec tunnels, etc., even that kind of transmission cannot be uh, sniffed. So confidentiality is taken care. And uh, the other thing is integrity. When I say integrity, it means the um, contents of a particular data. So you need to ensure that, okay, the data is available, it is confidential, but how do you ensure that you the data cannot be changed. So you can have uh, things like um, uh, ideas, etc., which um, shows that in the event of any change in the files, uh, the alert will be sent, uh, etc. So integrity also plays a key role. And availability is something which I've already spoken about. So availability also plays a key role as part of security as well. So the three main things about security is CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Coming to performance, 
So when I say performance, yeah, so once you have set your network or you are setting up your network, so you need to ensure that it has the um, uh, uh, right kind of um, uh, performance. So definitely some kind of test is required before you make anything go live. For example, you have internet links, you have WAN links, you have LAN, ensure you run adequate tests to ensure that you are getting the required uh, uh, performance out of it. There should not be any errors, any packet drops or any latency related issues, everything has to be taken into consideration while setting up a network. Okay, scalability, I like this particular picture because of the number of people on this particular train, uh, typically somewhere in India, you can see these kind of things happening. Yeah, scalability is again very important. The reason being, uh, you buy a particular product now and tomorrow you know that, okay, your number of users in your company has doubled and your current product is not able to meet that kind of traffic. So you should not be in a position where you have to discard that equipment and buy a totally new one. So this will have a lot of issues related to getting an approval from your management and uh, it has financial implications, etc. So it is important to ensure that while you are procuring something, the device should be scalable or it should be modular in nature so that tomorrow if you need any new service or any additional things to be included, you can always buy a separate module and insert it in your existing equipment. So that is very important. And uh, the other criteria is it should meet future requirements with minimal investment. So that is the whole idea of uh, scalability. So I am done with uh, network design considerations. I'll just move on to network operations key elements. Okay, I just picked up the slide uh, related to ITIL, but I am not really going to talk about what ITIL is about, etc. I am just going to touch upon why uh, process is required or from operations perspective, why are some of the elements critical? For example, change management. If I take change management as an example, the reason why it is important that any changes to your network, to your devices, firewalls, etc. has to be authorized. Unauthorized changes should not happen at all at any cost. So the reason why you have change management process, there is a process. So an uh, engineer raises a ticket, the ticket gets viewed by the manager, manager looks at the implications and if there are any rollback options and then approves it and then the configuration is made, etc. So this helps in ensuring that unauthorized configuration changes are not made to your network. And uh, even from audit perspective, this uh, plays a very uh, critical role. And Configuration management is also critical, the reason being you'll have your, all your configurations, your inventory, etc. Uh, and inventory management also plays a very critical role in the security of a network because you need to know what are the elements in your network which is currently there, what has been taken out or what has been included. So inventory also plays a key role. And other things like service level management, yeah. Service level also plays a very important role, so you have your SLAs, etc. defined. Uh, even for your end users, for example, when you log a call, your uh, response time would be so many hours, your resolution time will be so many hours. So this way you can track, I mean, or you can uh, uh, give better services to your end users or even clients. So service level management plays a very key uh, role in uh, network operations. And things like incident management, yeah, incident management is also important from security perspective. So any incident happening, it has to be logged and appropriate action has to be taken. And if these incidents keep happening, same kind of incidents happen continuously, then it becomes part of problem management. So where you do a root cause analysis and uh, try to find a solution which will fix that issue forever. And uh, the other key thing with network operations is uh, uh, management and monitoring, monitoring as well, monitoring plays a very key role. So you need to ensure you have uh, a proper network management systems in your network which can monitor the health of your devices in terms of performance, in terms of availability, in terms of uh, any security events happening on these devices, etc. 
So NMS plays a very critical role with respect to network operations. <clears throat> So yeah, I mean I'm not going to talk about each and every element in this, but I just want to ensure that you know, operations also play a very key role and what you need to do. And ITIL is one of the uh, things which help in ensuring the operations are uh, going smoothly. And also there is a scope always for improvement. So you have um, continuous service uh, process improvement as well included in this part of ITIL, which is very critical. So we cannot you know, configure everything and uh, assume everything is fine without doing any improvements. So improvement also plays a very critical uh, part of it. Okay. <coughs> the power of people, process and technology. So let me, people, so the first thing is about people. Why people is a key why are people key from security perspective so the picture I have put here is to represent senior management but uh, I think they don't really look like senior management but yeah <laughs> but yeah so from senior management it is important you have a buy-in from senior management for security I mean even they should be serious about security of data transactions etc in your network and you definitely need to ensure you have required support from senior management. They, they are one of the people who play a key role in ensuring uh, security of your network. <clears throat> the second aspect in my experience is also the security administrator. I mean, you have all the products, fancy products in place, but ultimately if it is not configured based on standards or if the administrator is you know, overlooking something and misconfiguring it, etc., there are a lot of implications on the network. If not in the short run, it will definitely have an impact in the long run. So some misconfiguration might be compromised by some hacker you know, a couple of years later or a year later. So it is important for the security administrators or network administrator to be smart. They have to be smarter than the hackers. I mean, that is the only way you can protect your network. Just by deploying the products and assuming everything will be fine is definitely not the right way to go. So that's the reason in my experience I feel security administrators play a very key role. They have to be smart and they also need to be trained as well. Uh, adequately but again a lot of things depend on <coughs> sorry uh, self motivation and self reading so the administrator has to keep himself updated on what are the kind of security attacks happening around and ensure that the network is taken care accordingly okay yeah the next thing is on the end users, the employees in an organization, how do they play a key role? So you have your senior management buy-in, you have good technology, you have a security administrator who is smart, but at the end of the day, if the employees are not are revealing information about their passwords or for example the administrator himself reveals his administrator password to other colleagues etc then the whole point of security goes for a toss so it is important that adequate information security awareness is given to these end users to make them understand the importance of security the importance of not opening unwanted files or sending out data or getting in data etc so information security awareness are very very plays a very key role in the security of the organization. So one of the uh, good, I mean, I'm not sure if you guys have heard about uh, Kevin, Kevin Mitnick. So Kevin Mitnick's, um, uh, the way he got information was purely on social engineering. So um, the way he got it is just talking to people and getting the passwords from there, making use of it or making rather making misuse of it and that's the reason how he became popular and he was uh, arrested and I think jailed for a couple of years or so 
no, in, uh, because he was involved in around 100 odd crimes including the government also in US and he says that it uh, all his uh, exploits etc have been purely on social engineering so which shows that how important it is for people to be aware of security and uh, yeah so from Kevin Mitnick perspective I think there are couple, he has written some two three novels I have read Art of Deception and uh, Ghost in the Wires so I think that is pretty good read so security enthusiasts, enthusiasts out there can also probably pick it up and uh, read. <clears throat> Coming to process so process again uh, in my previous slide on ITIL I have spoken a little bit on this so why process is important okay assuming your people are good your technology is good but if you don't have a proper in process in place then what happens for example an administrator leaves the organization and there is no process to remove his ID from the firewall or from the router etc there are good chances that that particular person can uh, you know, go out of the organization, log in from outside and then uh, tamper with the data or with the systems etc. So it is a very important aspect, process plays a very important uh, aspect with in terms of security. So kindly ensure your processes are in place and there are adequate checkpoints, reviews or audits in place to ensure that your processes are fine and there are no loopholes at all. So last but not the least, technology. I mean, of course, you have people, you have process, but you have equipments which are like reached end of life or have no support or have a lot of bugs in them which can be exploited. Then there is mm, the other two aspects will simply fail because of your technology not being up to date. But again, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, you just need to buy uh, state-of-the-art uh, equipments for your network. So you need to take a decision whether it is really required for your network, whether it meets your requirements. If not, you can always go for the product which is you know, actually required. So, but however, ensure that uh, your uh, software updates, etc., are up to date and they do not contain any um, uh, security loopholes which can be exploited by an hacker. Okay, I think I'll run uh, quite quickly now because I think we hardly have any, any time. So some of the top network uh, security threats uh, increase in the number of users. There are a bunch of users nowadays. There's so much of information being exchanged, etc. So this might lead to a lot of issues with terms of security. The second thing is mobile uh, proliferation. There are a lot of mobility users in place. So uh, so how do you integrate mobile into your network, etc. What kind of information it has? plays a very key role in terms of security. Then uh, moving forward everything is going to be on IP and that too if uh, IPv6 is going to be introduced each device will have an IP and there will be an overdose of IP in your network and you will have to ensure it is monitored properly. Virtualization also plays a key role. The reason being uh, there are so many things which are going virtual so ultimately you will not know whether the attack was virtual <laughs> the outcome was virtual, God knows what can happen in terms of virtualization. So that also plays a very key role in uh, terms of security. And uh, other things are like you can have DOS attacks, you can focus attacks on a network from outside and from internal users as well. <clears throat> okay, this particular slide I think um, uh, this is just an illustrator. Uh, maybe you can take a look at it later on. I think because the session is going to be recorded, you can always go back and see the. This is again very illustrative and does not mean these are the best products in the market. You need to ensure, you need to evaluate it meets your requirements and uh, and both your business and technical requirements and only then opt for this any other product mentioned here or even otherwise any other product which is not mentioned here as well. So please uh, don't assume that these are the uh, best of the breed products. And some of the useful links I have is on the network world, such security. So it is important to keep yourself updated with uh, various things which is happening around you. 
otherwise uh, security just goes for a toss. So what I keep telling is security is not a one-time activity. It is like grooming yourself. If you don't groom yourself on a regular basis, you will probably stink or you will probably die. So security is very, very important. So having said this, uh, I'm bringing this session to a closure. So if you have any questions, uh, I would definitely like to take it up. <coughs> Okay, I can see some. Okay, there's one question by Baskar Kumar. He says, how to make a DMZ more secure? So DMZ more secure, you just need to ensure that you open the right, uh, you no, know, only allow the specific IP address and only on a specific port. And uh, also ensure logging is enabled on the firewall and it is pushed to a <coughs> syslog server or something. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, to a utility which will actually capture all the logs and store for future purposes. Okay, there is another question by Rishi Raj Singh Gaur. Uh, if we had good firewall and antivirus, then it is necessary to use DMZ network to secure our network from hackers? No, I mean this point of DMZ is if you want to host anything which is to be accessed by the internet, only then you need it, the DMZ. So DMZ does not mean that if you have antivirus, DMZ is not required, etc. So that is not the funda. Okay, I'll move on to the next one by Chandrasekhar uh, Kondaka. Uh, can you again go on for topic ideas? Uh, I think we are, are, don't have much time, but uh, from ideas perspective, you can place your ideas in different locations in your network. So it is not necessary, as I mentioned, that in my architecture I've shown IPS on, or IDS between uh, the core switch and the firewall. So depending on the requirement, you can uh, uh, place it accordingly in your network. So you need to analyze your network thoroughly and decide where you want your ideas to be or where do you feel malicious traffic could happen or where do you feel that you need to protect uh, key information. The next question is from Ajay Singh which says uh, in network in sequence where this, this device kept accordingly firewall and IPS and module require like signatures etc. So we have basic Juniper firewall no extra component. Yeah I think my previous question will probably answer uh, this. So it again depends on your network. So understand your network and decide where you want to position your IPS. Where do you feel it's prone to attack from uh, uh, malicious user? or uh, you can place it where you need confidential data has to be protected, etc. So accordingly, you need to take a decision where your IPS has to be positioned. The next question is from Venkat Raman Ganapati Raman. Uh, how do you avoid situations such as spam means entering your network, especially when the very server spam host which blacklists senders of one get pounded with up to 300 GB of data per second which happen uh, very recently, yeah, I did, I did, I did read about uh, this particular thing, but somehow I'm not getting uh, what exactly happened with respect to spam house. So, uh, so I mean, ultimately, if the, your product itself is getting bombarded with such kind of uh, uh, DOS attacks, I mean, definitely need to relook re at what the product can offer or whether your you know, filters in the perimeter are secure enough to prevent such kind of DOS attacks which can happen on these servers. So having said that, I think there are no more uh, questions. So I'm bringing this session to an end. And uh, once again, thanks a lot for all your participation. Okay, I think there's one more couple of questions. Okay, my question is why really need transparent firewall instead we have a routed firewall? <coughs> so transparent firewall is typically used in situations where you 
there is one is shortage of IP address, so you don't have to make any changes in the network due to which you need to change the IP address of the device, etc. So that's where typically transparent firewall is used. But however, the best recommendation is to go for routed firewall. You configure with the required IP addresses, etc., and ensure it is there. And I have a question from Fateh Ahmed. Can you please let us know some of the most demanding certificate network security in hacking worldwide? Okay, this is a good question. I think many of them would be keen on knowing this. Mm. Um, so, so in terms of uh, security, you have uh, CCNA, CCNA security, CCIE security, etc. And from hacking perspective, you can start with CH, although it's not a great, uh, uh, this is again my opinion, but yeah, it's good to start off with. And uh, you have a certificate related to CISA, CISSP, uh, etc. And even something from SANS, you have a certification which, is, which will help from security perspective. And uh, the other question is from Satish Kumar, how to configure IPsec tunnel and Cisco router using different key format? I mean, this is something I think which you'll have to take a look and see. I'm not too sure about this particular uh, thing. I can always get back to you or you can send me a mail on my email ID. Well, thank you so much for the insightful presentation, Akshay. I'm really thankful yeah. to you for conducting this webinar. It was a great session. I would also like to Thanks thank a lot, all our participants for the support in making this webinar a success. The recording of this session would be available on TechGeek.com by tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.